So, okay, welcome back with the 13th lecture in this class. Wow, scary. So let me quickly recap what we did. So we have GRD is the space of d-dimensional uh, subspaces, uh, vector subspaces of C infinity. And um, we have shown that for every space X, homotopy classes of maps from X to GRD are equivalent to isomorphism classes of vector spaces on X, complex vector spaces. Uh, I'm doing this theory for, for the complex numbers because it's easier and uh, it simplifies uh, some of the stuff I'm going to do today. Uh, I might say how you, what you need to modify a bit at the end for if you want to work with the real numbers. So far, everything worked very bad in, but you'll see that today something more complicated happens. And the next step is we want to see GRD is the same as BUD, the classifying space of the d-dimensional unitary group seen as a, as a E1 space, you know, every, every topological monoid is in particular a E1 space. So uh, we get, we get to talk about its classifying space. And in order to do that, we have proven a criterion that's very helpful. So suppose we have P e to be a vibration, G a topological group, acting on E over B, by which I mean every every multiplication by, by any, element, any element of the group respects the projection to B, or if you want, uh, B is an equivariant map when B is given the trivial action. That's another way of saying it, um, such that we have a homeomorphism. This map is a homeomorphism. In fact, it's not really necessary. Uh, it's enough to say that it's a homotopy equivalence, but for simplicity, since it's the only case where we apply, it's going to be a homeomorphism. Let me just say it's a homeomorphism. And the classical example of these things are principal bundles. Um, so suppose E is contractible, uh, then there exists a canonical equivalence of E1 groups uh, of G with omega B. Uh, sorry, I always forget about this. I want to say a surjective vibration. And here you can put any. This in particular implies that B is connected. And so you can put whichever point you want as the base point for the loop space. And the identification, of course, depends on the base point. But... And in particular, BG is homotopy equivalent to B, which is what we're going to use. Okay, so in a sense, this lemma should be thought of as some kind of the analog of the, the strategy we used to find a fundamental group uh, last semester. So remember, we, found, we want to find a covering space whose total space is contractible and with a group that acts simply transitively on each fiber uh, we, with covering space automorphisms. And, these ident and we had this identification of this group with the fundamental group of the base. This is sort of the same thing. You have to ask for more, of course. You have to ask, well, simply transitively, it's basically this condition here. That's this plus some minor topological compatibility. That's it's trivial, for example, when P is a fiber bundle. Um, so that's not particularly important, but we have to ask that E is contractible. And then our topological group, uh, 
actually sees the whole loop space, not only its pi node, not only the pi one of the base. So instead of simply connective, we look with contractible, and we see the full loop group. Okay, so let's apply it in our case. So we want to find a vibration over GRD. And that's going to be fairly easy. So let us consider M C N C infinity. And we can call this V D, or sometimes it's called V D C infinity, but I'm going to just write V D for uh, for brevity, which is the space of isometric embedding of Cn into C infinity. You can think of it as the collection x1, xn. Oh, sorry, this was supposed to be a d, of course x1, xd, such that the norm of the xi's is 1, and xi is orthogonal to xj for i different than j uh, in, uh, in c infinity to the d. Yes, because every embedding is uniquely determined by the image of the basis vectors. So I just need to give an orthogonal set of dimension d in c infinity. We have a map P from VD to the Grassmannian that sends every embedding to its image. And as I said, you have to check that this is indeed continuous by the topology I've put everywhere, but it is because if you, under the corresponding correspondence with projections, this is just uh, F, uh, F transpose. Yeah, I'm using this, I think, for the transpose. And this actually, you have to check that this multiplication actually makes sense, but by the finiteness uh, assumption that we have on C infinity, this actually does make sense. Uh, so so it, it is actually a polynomial function, so it is continuous. And this P is, well, and we have, we have um, U D action on VD by precomposition because UD, remember UD is just isometries from CD to CD. So, uh, well, so if you precompose an isometric embedding by an isometry, you, you get uh, and this is actually a right action. I think I, I wrote the lemma for the left actions last time, but of course you can just precompose with the inverse map or whatever if you want to get a left action. Uh, is, is, is an inessential detail at some level. Um, okay. So, and the action is, is obviously simply transitive on, on each fiber. Uh, and in fact, we'll see in a second that it satisfies that stronger condition. I think this is automatic since UD is uh, compact. That's another small advantage, but anyway, we're going to verify it directly. So it's not a big deal. And so in fact, what I'm going to show is that P is a fiber bundle. Uh, and even more, if um, W is one of the standard open subsets that I described um, last time, we have we have a UD equivariant homeomorphism W times UD, sorry, UD times W, P inverse of uh, W. And this is actually, with these you can actually easily show that the map from G times VD to VD to the fiber product 
is uh, indeed a, a homeomorphism. Uh, it's obviously bijective because the action is simply transitive in each fiber, and then it's open because you can check on these open subsets of E. Well, okay, you have to check on, the, on their fiber product, but still. Um, so this condition is actually the condition of being a principal G bundle. And um, yeah, and this is, well, this is, uh, um, so remember this, this W was, was, was determined by the choice of a subspace, which now I want to call V, but I probably shouldn't. Uh, so, but in given in S in GRD, Remember WS is the set of all uh, S prime GRD such that the orthogonal projection is surjective when restricted to S prime. And this was homeomorphic to home from S to S orthogonal. And the, the homeomorphism is just a graph sense of. Uh, a map from S to S orthogonal to its graph. And so, well, what is P inverse of W? P inverse of W is the set of embeddings, isometric embeddings, such that the image uh, of F is in WS. In WS. And that is P S of F, the image of P S of F is, uh, is S. And uh, well, you can, so this map is supposed to be, so let, let us choose F zero from C D to S isomorphism. You can always do that. Uh, let's just as a base point, and this gives us a map from U times W to uh, what do we want to say? Uh, I want to construct an, an inverse map here to the multiplication map. And so if I have such an F, I can send it, all oh, right, yes. I can send it to F0 inverse PSF, comma, the image of F. That is, this gives me a map from CD to, to uh, C infinity, but that this projects. So the, this lands into S. And then you can use F0 to, to go back. This is, this is essentially is telling you which change of coordinates you need to pick. And sorry, can, can you remind me what the capital PS? Oh, sorry, PS from C infinity into S is just the orthogonal projection into S. Uh -huh, okay. This is just some basic linear algebra. It's, again, it is fairly obvious that the map is simply transitive in each fiber. You just need to show that the inverse map is continuous. And I gave you a formula for the inverse map. And it is continuous. So, this, so in particular, P is a vibration because it's a fiber bundle. And the condition, and it's uh, in fact a principal bundle. Principal bundle. So to prove GRD is equivalent to BUD, we miss 
we are only missing one step. Which is the following proposition. VD is contractible. Okay. Questions before I go to, for, for this maybe sketchy argument of the tech to show that this satisfies the technical hypothesis? No. Okay. So let's do the, the geometric part and prove that this guy is indeed contractible. Uh, this goes in, in three steps. It's a bit uh, confusing. Uh, first of all, I'll do what uh, Joachim wanted me to do, and I'll consider a bigger, uh, a bigger space, the space of all embeddings that are not necessarily isometric, so injective, C-linear maps. This contains VD, of course. And step one, the inclusion VD inside VD tilde is a uh, homotopy equivalence. And this, I toyed with the idea of being cheeky and say, oh, you already did it in your first year linear algebra class because this is secretly the Gram Schmidt algorithm. Uh, if you think of it, this is a D sequences of D things that are orthonormal, and these are sequences of D things that are linearly independent, and you did the Grand Schmidt argument that tells you exactly how to retract from one to the other. But let me give you the details. Uh, but you'll see that it is essentially the Grand Schmidt uh, algorithm. Uh, so, <clears throat> actually, I think when I took the class on this, the professor said something. Oh, and as an exercise, check that the Gram-Schmidt algorithm gives you a retraction. Uh, it is kind of obvious, but you know, let me let me be a bit more explicit. So let me define this VD is going to be VDV leaving inside VDV minus one, etc., until you get VD zero, which is VD tilde, where VDI is the maps which are injective, C linear, and F restricted to C to the I is an isometry. So we filter it one basis element at a time. And we we're going to show that VDI inside VDI minus one uh, is a homotopy equivalence. So we are making the basis, an orthonormal basis, one step at a time. And uh, okay, let's go one step further. And uh, filter these, uh, let's see if I, what did I call it? One small piece. So remember, these are the first if coordinates. If you want x1, xi is orthonormal. And this is x1, xi, xi, sorry, x1, xi minus one is orthonormal, where xi is the image of EI under this, this correspondence I gave before. And here we're going to filter with X1, XI minus one is orthonormal and XI is orthogonal to the XJ for J less than I. If you remember the Grand Schmidt argument is exactly what we do. And okay, uh, let's tackle these, this second here first, because that's quite obvious. It, it's just a matter of rescaling. So we have a retraction, a deformation retraction. Oh, sorry, not this one. This one I wanted to say. This one is just a matter of rescaling. 
uh, prime to v, v i. So this was zero one action. And essentially we send t times x1 xn to x1 <coughs> xi minus one. And remember we need to fix the norm of it. So we take um, t plus one minus t over the norm of xi times xi, xi plus one xn. And these indeed just gives me a deformation retraction. So actually, maybe I should say the deformation retraction is a map like this. That it's a, uh, that factors through the inclusion at one and is the identity at zero. So, okay. So that was actually, let me use some colors for this. And the second one is trickier, but if you've seen Grand Schmidt again, uh, you just need to kill off the projections of xi onto xi minus one, x1, x1, x1 minus one. So again, we get a map like this, deformation retraction. And this sense again, this doesn't change the first ones, uh, but we are going to change the next one by. Well, if you remember what Gram Schmidt is saying, he's saying you have to remove uh, xi, comma, x1 times x1, xi, comma, xi minus one, x1 minus one, and then you just doesn't ch don't change the other coordinates and you know to get a homotopy you just stick a t in front of this and you're done as i told you it's literally the gram schmidt algorithm it's really no new ideas that you haven't seen before maybe you no one ever told you that the gram schmidt alg algorithm is secretly a reduction of the structure group but it is uh, so okay So, upshot, it's enough to show V tilde is contractible. And, but there are still two more steps, unfortunately. Uh, it's not, it's not obvious. It would, I would like to just do a straight line homotopy, but I cannot. So I have to, to fix it somehow first. And the way to fix it is the following. Uh, how did I call it? Yeah, WD. <coughs> Let WD, or it, the subspace of FD tilde, such that Oh, yeah, yeah, so first, sorry, I need a, a name first. So let F0 build a, uh, the standard embedding as the, you know, sending E1 to E1, E2 to E2, et cetera, et cetera. Sending one, uh, X goes to X comma zero, 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 et cetera. Then WD is all the Fs such that the image of F is orthogonal to uh, the image of F0. Or said differently, all the Fs of the embeddings such that F of X is as zero on the first D coordinate. Okay. And 
So I'll, I'll tell you exactly what the steps are. Now, step two is the inclusion of WD in VD tilde is a homotopy equivalence. And step three is this inclusion is no homotopic. And putting step two and step three together, we get our thesis. Step three is the easier one. So actually, let me tell you how you do it. This is just, you get a map zero one times WD into the tilde, which just does a straight line homotopy um, with F zero. And you can check that for every T, this map is indeed injective. And that's the reason why we're res we restricted to WD. Because this map is. So here you, you can just do a straight line homotopy. So it's only step two that's missing. And step two, we still have a deformation retraction. So let TD from C infinity to C infinity, the map that sends X to zero, zero X. These are the first D coordinates. So that's a shift. If you want, I could write a matrix representing T to the D, but uh, I expect everyone is able to do that. Uh, and this is an injective map. Um, so in particular, uh, you can you have a map from VD tilde to WD sending F to T to the D F. Just shifting. And I want to say that this is this is part of a deformation retraction. And magically, I'm going to be able to do just a straight line homotopy again. Sending uh, f comma t to t f plus one minus t t to the d f, and you have to check that for every t this map is actually injective. So we need to check that for every t is injective. And what it boils down to is to check that if tx plus one minus t, t to the dx is zero, this implies that x is zero. Yeah. That's what it boils down to. And, but then you can work coordinate by coordinate. So if uh, t equals zero, well, uh, we have t to the dx is zero, therefore x is zero. So suppose t is non zero, then on every coordinate we have t times xi uh, plus one minus t xi minus d is zero, where the negative coordinates are, are always zero and you go by induction, induction on i. For example, tx, uh, tx is zero is zero, therefore x zero is zero, and then you go by induction and you get the older coordinates into the zero. And that's the end of the proof. Let me just record a special case. V1 is X in C infinity with norm one, that's what's called the unit sphere, is contractible. Because that is sometimes useful. And there are 
couple of exercises using this fact in the exercise sheet. Other questions? No, good. So everything so far works with, uh, uh, with, with, with real numbers as well. So let me just get the upshot. The upshot is that homotopy classes of vector spaces over any space X is the same thing. So as a morphism class of vector spaces, the same thing as, uh, as homotopy classes of maps to BUD. Okay. And uh, as an exercise, if P from E to X is a vector bundle, omega p of the mapping space where I'm identifying p with any map representing it, it's not that important, uh, is equivalent to the topological group of automorphisms of p. Yeah, of p, I guess I should say. So maps from e to e over x that are c linear on each h value. So this, so it makes sense to define vect x as maps from x to b u d. It's very easy if you take p the trivial bundle, uh, but it's also not hard in general. Essentially, because you can reduce always to the case of a of a, of a trivial bundle by looking at open subsets in the base. Excuse me? Yes? Um, when you're writing the UD, uh, don't you mean also VECT D then? Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Of course. Uh, and actually, yeah, since you mentioned it, uh, let me actually put as a corollary Pi zero vect x is homotopy classes of maps. You're right, absolutely, that should be. Okay, thank you. And in the definition of vect of x, also then. I, I'm taking these. I'm taking. These. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, vect. D. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, of course. In fact, I could have given a definition of these using some kind of can enriched category with vector bundles automorphism, and then this would be a proof that this as a space is exactly this. But we don't need that to, to be all fancy. Okay. Uh, the corollary is, well, the proof you can reduce to the case connected is x connected since both sides send coproducts to products and then in the every vector bundle has a precise rank By the way, I should also say that there is a proof of this fact using Brown representability. I was uncertain whether to do that, the one I did or, or, or that other. Uh, you can try to think about it. Uh, it's not unlike the proof I gave as an exercise for uh, covering spaces. Of course, it's slightly trickier to show that the representing space is exactly this guy. You need what's called a clutching function. I don't know if you've ever seen them mentioned, but. Okay. 
Okay, questions? Because it is time to reintroduce infinity spaces in, in the mix, because vector bundles have a, have a operation you can do on them. You can take the direct sum of them. And we want to say that this gives you an infinity structure. So let's do it for vector spaces. So definition. Uh, I think I was a bit inconsistent in my notation in the notes. Hmm. Yeah, I think this is going to be confusing. If I, I mean, it's not false, but let me use a different notation here and change it in the notes afterwards. Let me call V. It is curly V here. Um, a map from thin star into spaces in this sense i plus to uh, the collection which is um, a collection of vector subspaces uh, index like i such that by the i is orthogonal to i j v j for i different than j So in particular, V of one plus is equivalent to this space. V U D. Oh, and I didn't tell you what the maps are, sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay, this doesn't need the maps, but I also need to tell you what it happens on the maps. And to be precise, I tell you this is a function to topological spaces and then I'm taking the homotopy type. Uh, This sends the i sent to the sum uh, for over the fiber of j the i, and that's why we need this orthogonality condition because now this this is perfectly well defined and makes sense. And if you want to play, you can you you can um, write it in terms of projection. So, for example, this condition is. Is because this condition and etc. Again, that's just to check that what I'm describing were actually well-defined closed subspaces of our of our topological space. Okay, so quite straightforward. And here I'm just taking the sum of the projections secretly. Okay. So that's a functor. Uh, and now I want to claim that uh, B is an e infinity space. This is not obvious, not completely. And the proof, well, we need to show essentially that V of n plus goes to the product for i equals one to n V of one plus, sending V one V n to, well, V uh, i, I guess, is, um, is a homotopy equivalence. The characteristic maps, remember, just tend uh, every element of i sends the i element to, to, to one and everything else to the base point. So this sends uh, the characteristic map at i just sends the collection of the vi's to just the i component of this collection. And note that this is not a homeomorphism because this is just a space of all n of subspaces. But this is the space of n of pairwise orthogonal subspaces. So there is actually a subspace inclusion. Uh, and I'll show you that it is indeed a homeomorphism. This is again some version of Gram Schmidt, but I'm not going to 
to, to do it that way. I'm just going to use what we already did to deduce it. So, so remember you can, uh, sorry, M plus, you can write it as the disjoint union, D1, Dn greater or equal to zero of the subspace of D1, Dn, Dn plus, such that the dimension of Di is Di. That I can definitely do. And let me call this Dn plus D underline, where the underline is this sequence D1, Dn. And so what it boils down to is to show that this map, well, actually you can write GR D1, GR DN is an equivalent. And now why am I doing this? Well, because as it happens, I have a map from the Stiefel manifold of dimension of rank D1 plus Dn here. In this sense, F from C D1 Dn into C infinity to the image of F restricted to the Di component. Uh, sorry, I one to n. Uh, that's why I want isometric embeddings. This is where it's starting to be convenient to use un instead of, of gln. Because I have this uh, independence condition for free. And you know you can redo the proof as before. with the group now UD1 times UDN. You can think of acting on CD1 plus DN as block matrices. Uh, and you see that this V, the underline N plus is exactly the product. Sorry, I should say be a bit more precise. Uti, but that's just the product. Because B commutes with products, being a geometric realization with finite products. And now you can just check that this projection here is exactly the projection on the factors here. So it's exactly what we want. I think it is not impossible to construct a chain of, of deformation retractions as, as in the previous proof in this case as well, but I'm very much not uh, planning to do that. In this case, it's, we have it as an immediate consequence of what we already did, so. And so remark, so first of all, pi zero of V is just the natural number with the obvious monoid structure. But we can do something more. We can do also for any space map X into V, which is just a functor that sends I plus to map X into V of I plus is also an infinity space. That's just obvious because you can, every time you have a functor that respects finite products, you can apply it to an infinity space and get another infinity space. And pi zero of maps from X to V 
Well, uh, we know it's the isoclasses of, of vector bundles. Um, uh, on X, but with operation the direct sign. Why is it so? So in fact, how do you define the group operation, the monoid operation, sorry, on P0? So you go pi zero map X mu one plus pi zero map X and one plus. So that's just pi zero of maps from X one plus pi one plus. You precompose with this map that's invertible but goes in the other direction. Two plus, and you just use the sum there. If So that's the operation. And so what did what this boils down to? We have a vector bundle here, and we have another vector bundle here, uh, which is the same thing as a map from X to the Grassmannian. So we have a, a map from X to the say Grassmannian D times Grassmannian D prime. But the point is, since the space of, uh, this, by, by the remark I just proven, I can choose such a map. I mean, point is, I, I want to choose such a map such that the two images are orthogonal to each other. I can move the two maps so the images become orthogonal to each other. So let me choose this F, F prime such that for every x, f of x is orthogonal to f of x prime. And I can always make a choice. And then the map here is just literally, I take the direct sum point-wise. f of x, f of x prime is sent to f of x. And so the, the, on isoclasses, it exactly gives me the, the direct sum. If we a short question to the construction of V. Is, yes. Okay. And don't we a priori also have to give homotopies? Is this here obvious that? Um, so the, the 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 reason for this is for this restriction is that these maps now are this is actually a functor. It's defined on topological spaces and that projects into spaces. This is a well-defined at the point set level because the direct sum is for orthogonal subspaces is defined at the set level. The homotopies come secretly from uh, these homotopy from the inverses of these homotopy equivalents. Thanks. So that's you see that this formalism seems weird at first, but it's actually very convenient for defining these things. Uh, it's, it's very concrete. Okay, uh, what time is it? Oh, five past, good. Uh, so now you'll see why I spent one whole uh, lecture talk, waffling about the group completion theorem, because now it's time to, to use it. So I'm going to split it in two parts, but the, the proof is a, bit, is a bit intertwined, so I'm going to put them in the same statement. So the first statement is that the underlying space Ah, no, wait, I, I forgot the definition first. Well, you probably know it already, but so X space is finite if it uh, can be obtained from the point by finite coproducts and pushouts. 
by which I mean uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, it's uh, the full subcategory of spaces closed under finite co-products and push-outs and containing the, the point. Um, as an exercise, well, as an example, so if X is a finite CW complex, so it's the homotopy type, sorry. Or a finite CW complex, then X is finite because you can go through the cellular filtration and at every step you just push out a bunch of maps from the sphere. Oh, and uh, of course, all, particularly since the suspension is a, is a, is a push out. And as an other exercise, actually, uh, uh, the vice versa is also true. This is slightly harder and I leave it as an exercise. You have to show that if you have a finite space, you can build it uh, by, by attaching finitely many cells in the right order. And here you have to secretly use the fact that homotopy classes of maps between spheres are contractible if n is less than n. Essentially, when you take an attaching map, you have to move it to the smaller skeleton. We did some kind of these arguments last time. It's not very important for, for the following, but this is an exercise. And uh, more generally, X is finitely dominated if it is a retract of a finite space. It is actually not very important, but since it is the, the smallest hypothesis in the next theorem, I wanted to. And not all, not all finite spaces are finitely dominated. There is a famous abstraction due to wall. You can exactly find the condition that tells you when a finitely dominated space is finite. It's a k-theoretic kind of abstraction. K-theoretic in the sense of algebraic k-theory. Uh, it's a very fascinating story, but unfortunately, we have no time. I think there was a talk about that touches slightly on, on Monday about these things. Maybe, I don't remember if, uh, if Jonathan actually said, talked about the wall finite universal structure, but it's part of that circle of ideas of surgery theory. No, he didn't. Okay. It is, it is that. It's sort of the baby version of the theorem he was talking about. But okay. Anyway, as a proposition, so let me write it as a two statements. So, first of all, the underlying space. of uh, this group completion of V is BU times Z, where U is the infinite unitary group. U is the median of UN, that is all matrices, all the infinite matrices of this form. And the other statement is that map if X is finitely dominated, maps from X to V. So remember, this is the space of vector bundle and a group complete. Then this is maps X. I can move the group completion inside. In particular, maps from X to B U Z is a growth and decay group of vector bundles on X. That is groups of all formal differences of vector bundles. So not maybe it's not E, e it's in particular because uh, it's actually a stronger statement that you can move the group inside. I thought the proof is pretty much the same. Of the weaker statement. Okay. Is it clear what am I doing? Okay. So let's do first the first statement. So by the group completion theorem, we have V group 
is, oh, sorry. So remember pi zero of V I said was N, so I can take X equals one in N. Had the, 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 it was in the hypothesis of the group completion theorem. So we have uh, that the group completion of V is the telescope of one in V plus. With the plus construction. So let's compute the telescope. And in fact, we will see that the telescope is simply connected. So the plus construction will be unnecessary. So what is this telescope? So it's the co-limit of adding one. So we have this plus one. And if you look at the definition, at the nth component, this plus one is just this map here uh, that uh, sends A to A1. That's because you know this comes from the map BU1 times BUN to BUN plus one, which is induced by this map here, taking block matrices, and then I'm taking just the base point corresponds to the identity. So on the nth component, sorry, maybe I should make this in a different position, maybe here. So, so on the nth component, This gives exactly B U. That's I'm secretly using that B commutes with colimits since it's left adjoint. Uh, because I have a colimit and I want to, I'm, I'm taking the colimit of the E U N instead of the colimit of the B U N. It's a left adjoint. That's not a problem. And then the connected components. Uh, Z. By, by, because at every step I'm adding a new connected component corresponding to, to the zero, this joint union here. And you can see that, well, okay, the, the connected component is just the colimit of n plus one, n plus one, n plus one. And that's okay, that's Z. That. Uh, I mean, that should be fairly clear for everyone how this works. That's colimit in. Sets. Okay, so tell one v is b u times z, and now pi one of tell one v is pi one of b u. It's pi zero of u, and I'm pretty sure we saw at some point um, last semester that this is in fact connected. That if it u haven't seen it, uh, well, let's see. What's the quickest way of, of, of showing it? Well, okay, we at some point we, we saw that there is a fiber sequence like this. And then you go by induction, you start with U1 is S1 is connected and you go by induction with long exact sequence on homotopy groups. And you see that UN is connected for every N. I think we discussed this last semester. If we didn't, this was just a quick reminder. Uh, if not, you, it's actually not super hard to explicitly construct a, a path for any point to, to the identity. But. So tell one V plus is tell one V. That's B U times Z. And this and this does the the first statement. Now and this was so therefore this is B G B. So now the second statement is let us consider map. G. 
Is this clear? Uh, am I going too fast in this argument? No? Okay. So now let's try to understand this. So, okay. Uh, I could give you actually a similar proof, but certainly we can consider this mapping telescope. where one is uh, the constant function at one, or if you want, this corresponds to the trivial uh, vector bundle of rank one. Now here the magic appears. Here you use that X is finitely dominated. I probably should have given as an XSS before, but since X is finitely dominated, Mapping out of X commutes with filter collimates. Why is it so? Uh, well, okay. The remark, the property map X blank commutes with filter collimates is closed and the uh, finite co-products, push-outs, and uh, retracts. That's actually an exercise, isn't it? So, and it's true for the point. Yeah. And so it's true for all finitely dominated spaces. But then this is map X. Yeah, what we proved. Okay, but then this means in particular that pi zero tell one map X V is a group. So X has the property. So inverting X, this is just, but this is just pi zero map X V with x inverted. So x has the property that every element is, is a sum and of some multiple of x. x has the property needed for the group completion theorem. And uh, so math x e g p is tell one map x v plus, but hold on, this is map x v uh, v g p plus, but that's plus applied to, to a group. A group is already abelian, in particular hyperabelian, so. There is nothing else to be done. Could you maybe recall the hypo hypothesis we need on X uh, for the statement that is a uh, retract of, or was this a hypothesis of this uh, theorem? It's a, no, I mean, I just need it for, for this step. Yeah. Did you put it as an hypothesis of the theorem and I just didn't recall? Or? I said that X is finitely dominated. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. No, that, that's very important. It's false otherwise. Actually, let me uh, say it as a remark. X finitely dominated is essential here. I don't have a simple counterexample, otherwise it's false. However, uh, Homotopy classes of maps to B, U, times Z do have an interpretation in terms of vector bundles for a general X, but it's more complicated. Um, Uh, 
right? So use there are a couple of choices you can make actually to give such an interpretation. The one I prefer uses what's called the Fidon complex, um, which is the analog of a perfect complex in the algebraic geometry setting. If you've seen that before, you can do a topological version of this story. Uh, um, can you scroll up a bit? Yeah, sorry. I think I have the time to give the, period, the proof of the bot periodicity theorem finally, and uh, the, the definition of the topological K-theory spectrum. And then Monday, I think I'll do some more examples and maybe some computations of the corresponding cohomology theory to topological K-theory. Um, I, I, I will see. Um, I don't think it makes sense to introduce a new topic on Monday, honestly. And I think you need maybe some more examples. Yeah. Is it okay? By the way, maybe I should mention the, this fact that X has the property needed for the group completion theorem. You can actually prove it directly if you want it. it, it if you remember last time I did something like over a compact space, every vector bundle as a complement, you can always embed it into a trivial vector bundle. And it isn't the, the, the geometricalization of every finite, the finitely dominated space is always compact because it's a retract of finite CW complex, which is compact. So you can, uh, you can actually do it by hand, but I wanted to give a purely homotopical proof because I don't know, because I think it's, it makes sense in this context. Okay. Questions? If not, it's time to prove a major theorem. And you will be surprised uh, how it falls down magically. It's about periodicity theorem. In fact, for the first statement, is not really the both periodicity theorem, but it's going to the both periodicity theorem is going to immediately follow from it. The classifying space of this E on infinity monoid that I described is just U. Therefore, omega U is B U times Z, because it was the group completion of V that we have seen is B U times Z. And just for the, for the periodicity version, omega square of u is u, because omega of bu is, is u. That's the periodicity part of the periodicity theorem. And maybe I should say that this proof, this approach, yeah, is due to Bruno Harris. A delightful short paper uh, that uh, shows that how you can deduce about periodicity from, from the theory of infinity spaces, which is very cool. Uh, there are a lot of proofs about periodicity. The original proof used Morse theory. Uh, there are a lot. There is a particularly nice one using uh, Clifford algebras. Uh, you can, there are at least 10 of the, of the things essentially different from each other. But this one I particularly like because, yeah, because I think it shows very clearly um, what the essential input. And you, here, I maybe I should mention, we actually do use the fact that U is, is U, is not GLNC uh, in this proof. I mean, the statement, of course, doesn't matter because U is equivalent to, GL, to GLC, but for the proof, we are going to use it in an essential way. So proof, well, B of V is the co-limit of top B of N by definition. So uh, how, do you, how do you do? Well, okay, we use, if you remember, we 
I gave back when I define homotopy co-limits and etc. I gave the fact that when you have a functor into topological spaces that satisfied some minor uh, some minor um, uh, cofibrancy conditions, that is, the, the face maps needs to be um, cofibrations, which is true in this case. Um, you can realize this as a quotient. Well, well, okay, greater or equal than zero modulo a certain equivalence relation. Uh, that's the same for the ordinary geometric realization. So that's, I'm going to prove that this particular model here, maybe I should say, is homeomorphic. To you. And that's, uh, yeah. And that will conclude the thesis. So let's get a map from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So what is an element on the left-hand side? An element on the left-hand side is a sequence, T0, Tn, and then we have spaces, V1, Vn, that are pairwise orthogonal. Well, where am, we, where am I ever going to send it? Well, I'm going to send it to the unitary map that has certain eigen that has v1, vn as eigenspaces and certain eigenvalues determined by the TIs. So in formulas, let me write down the formula so we are precise people. Um, so first I put, I say that my u is going to be the identity as eigenvalue one on the orthogonal of the sum of the vi's. And then I get e2 pi i t0 v0. So this is, remember that we want a unitary matrix. So, so the eigenspaces need to be orthogonal and the eigenvalues needs to be uh, complex numbers of unit modules. That's what it means to be orthogonal. That's going to be unitary, sorry. So we have this. And then E, oh, sorry, T, V1. I, T0 plus T1 times V2. And then you go 2 pi I, T0 plus T, N minus 1, T, N. And so I am saying, so essentially A is the matrix with eigenvalue uh, E to the two pi I T zero TR on VR. That's the matrix. And this respects the equivalence relation, for example, because if one of the TIs is zero, I'm just replacing the two, the, the, the two successive vector spaces with their direct sum, which is exactly what the equivalence relation is telling me. Respects. Oh, uh, sorry, why did I put VI? I want a projection, of course. Otherwise, it, sorry, that, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, this respects the simplicia relations. Um, because, for example, uh, replacing T uh, R, T R plus one with their sum, which is one of the face maps. is the same as removing VR plus one. Right, and, uh, and the same, and adding a zero is the same as, as a replacing 
dr dr plus one by dr plus dr plus one. So this respects the simplicial relations if you write it down, it does. So it passes through the, the quotient. And now I'm going to say it's a homeomorphism by the spectral theorem. Because the inverse, so the inverse works like this. We have A in U. This has some, some eigenvalues. Well, it certainly has one because this is the identity outside of a finite dimensional vector space. Then you have lambda one, lambda n, lambda i. They're ordered in a way that such that the argument of lambda i is greater than the argument of lambda i plus one. You can, you can always order them. The argument, remember, is an element in zero to pi. And then the inverse sends this and the say V zero, V one, V N are eigenspaces. And these sends uh, A in the end is sent to, well, I'm, I'm taking V one, V N as the spaces. And here I take, so what was it? Uh, argument of lambda one over two pi, argument of lambda two minus argument of lambda one over two pi, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, you just add two pi minus argument of lambda n over two pi. So that the sum indeed does one. And this gives you an inverse. And you have to check that it's continuous, it's continuity of eigenvalues and etc. But, uh, and actually, to, to see that it's continuous, you can actually reduce to compact subspaces on both sides. Like U, U is the union of the UNs. And here you can take the, the, the subspace of the Vs that are contained in C to the N. And you can see that it's a homeomorphism on these compact subspaces because it gives a bijection on each of these compact subspaces and then you filter it and you get it indeed that's a homeomorphism. That's kind of a minor point. I don't want to spend too much time on, on pointed topological issues, but this is also another way in which the compactness of UN is helpful. And so here we need it also to apply the spectral theorem uh, because for GLN, this wouldn't work at all. For GLN, this map won't be uh, an, an homeomorphism even if you allow the VIs just to be nearly independent, not orthogonal, that's still not enough because you hit only the diagonalizable matrices. Now it is true that the diagonalizable matrices, the inclusion of diagonalizable matrices into GLN is a homotopy equivalence, but that's a bit messy to prove using the showdown normal form and et cetera, which yeah. with UN instead it's super clear. Okay, so that was the proof of the bot periodicity theorem. Uh, I really like them. Just put a remark. Um, this is not enough over R. Over R, this shows uh, that Omega of U mod O is equivalent to B O times Z. With the same proof, you can play it a little bit. Um, the, the trick to notice is that U mod O is the same thing as symmetric unitary matrices. Um, you have to do a bunch of linear algebra, but. Uh, uh, this shows, but that's not enough to prove but periodicity, of course. But periodicity is a statement. And you can actually show a, another statement, which was, oh yeah, 
omega of sp mod, no, sorry, u mod sp. sp, sp where sp is the quaternionic unitary group now. But to get both periodicity, you need four other equivalences. And that requires an, a small new ingredient that I do not, don't have time to, to talk about. But over R, what happens is that omega 8 of O is O. And there are seven spaces you need to describe. Here I gave you um, one, two, three, four, and then you have O and SP. This gives you six, so there are two more, and okay. They are technically called O mod U and SP mod U. But uh, yeah, this gets a bit confusing, and uh, there is a lot of fun linear algebra going on here, uh, but it's, it's a bit messy. So I prefer the, to do in class the, the complex version. I might, at some point, for peace of mind on myself, to write down an extended exercise. Uh, how to, to get this, this more general statement over R. But uh, yeah, it's not going to be in the exercise sheet, don't worry. Uh, I, I really would like it, but uh, it's, it's a bit too messy. OK. But actually, you could try to prove this if you want. This is not hard, and it has basically the same ideas than the proof I just gave you. And that's. It's fun to see how these things pop out. OK. Now, uh, definition. And then I'm done. I define KU, the topological complex K theory spectrum. In the spectrum. B u times z, u, b u times z, u, b u times z, etc. With homotopy equivalences, you need to specify them. They're the one that are given by the bot periodicity theorem. And so, homotopy classes of maps from sigma infinity of x plus to k u are the same thing as pointed homotopy classes of maps here, which are the same thing as just plain homotopy classes of map from x to b u times z, which is pi zero vect x group, when x is finitely dominated. And these, remember, this was k used the zero of x. by definition. And uh, while well, KU1 of X is, uh, well, it's, I don't know a better description than homotopy class of maps from X to, to the unitary group. It is what it is. Uh, should be fairly concrete anyway. And in fact, KU has this magic property that KU is periodic. So this is KU0 of x if star is even, and KU1 of x if star is odd. In particular, KU is very, very far from being a connective spectrum. That's our first important example of an actually, honest to God, non-connective spectrum. So pi star of KU uh, z and zero for star even and for star odd. And that's a very important spectrum. And maybe I should also mention that you using real bot periodicity, which I haven't proven, one can define KO. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the homotopy groups of KO, maybe I think I'm morally obliged to mention them 
I learned this mnemonic there are eight periodic and I learned this mnemonic from Mike Hopkins so there are there is zero and zero uh, z to z to zero z zero 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 z uh, sorry uh, it's ridiculous but since my Hopkins told me this mnemonic I never forgot this these groups anymore uh, it's uh, it's uh, so this is star congruent to one star congruent to two star congruent to three star congruent to four five six and eight mod eight z to z to zero z zero 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 z uh, okay this is slightly more complicated as the fits the more complicated notion and uh, yeah i don't think i want to but there are many things i could say actually the best thing of thinking of the best way of thinking of ku is that there is a complex conjugation action on, on ku and you can think of KO as its homotopy fixed point and that explains the more complicated nature here. You can actually deduce these, these things from these things plus how the, the C2 action acts on KU. But that's a, a huge story and I, I really wish I had the time to do it. But I think at least as a hint of the, how these things work. And I think that's all I want to say for today. Uh, Monday, I'll do presumably some examples and some computations and key theory of complex projective spaces and stuff like that. But at least, so finally, after more than half the class, you finally have a genuine important example of a non-connective spectrum. Uh, took a while. <laughs> These things are. Maybe I should write them this bigger actually. Z to Z zero 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 Z. Something the groups. And so the congruence classes. And uh, yeah. Questions? If not, let me stop the recording.